A year ago, Sean Combs stood in Times Square and was handed a key to New York City. Today, he's been indicted and will face justice in the Southern District of New York. I was Diddy's publicist for a couple of years, about 20 years ago, so 2003, 2004. I ended up doing his publicity for, for, for a couple of years. Okay, gotta end your Friday with the scoop. Sean Diddy Combs could be fighting for his life amid federal and sex trafficking crime charges. And it doesn't help that during all of this, his longtime publicist has quit him. The most important thing, um, even more important than the passport, is that Mr. Combs came to New York on September 5th. As soon as we realized that this indictment was going to be coming down in a matter of weeks, maybe months, but sometime soon, um, Mr. Combs got on a plane, left his home in Florida, flew to New York. I called the prosecutors myself. The race is on for Sean Combs with him posed against the law. And it's not looking good for him, with his former publicist coming out to say he's a master manipulator and his current publicist quitting on him. People are wondering whether his lawyer might soon bail on him as well. For now, he's big on supporting his client, but with Diddy's prospects looking so glum, how long will that last? Now, let's start from the beginning. With raids on Diddy's homes apparently resulting in horrific discoveries, his time in jail probably isn't going well, especially since he was denied bail twice, despite offering up a hefty collateral that included a $50 million mansion. Fighting to be released on bail. His attorney writing in a letter to the court Wednesday that Combs is eminently trustworthy and should be released on a $50 million bond. The rapper offering to secure the bond with his $48 million Miami home and the bond would be co-signed with his mother, sister, three adult sons, and mothers of his two daughters. Combs was arrested Monday, and sources tell ABC News he has not been incarcerated with the general prison population. A judge denied him bail Tuesday after expressing concern that Diddy's alleged crimes occurred behind closed doors, with law enforcement unable to monitor his behavior. Someone's presumed innocent, so you're presumed that you get bail. Not in this kind of crime. In this kind of crime, bail is not presumed. Furthermore, you've got the problem that he's accused of intimidating witnesses, of trying to interfere with the investigation. None of that helps him in his argument that he should get bail. Combs pleaded not guilty to charges of racketeering and sex trafficking. A 14-page indictment alleges Combs manipulated women to participate in highly orchestrated performances of sexual activity with male prostitutes called freak-offs. His lawyer was understandably incensed after having fought for his client to come out, trying to present how cooperative Diddy had been during the investigation. He put forward how he had flown to New York as soon as he found out he'd be taken into custody. But it's obvious judges aren't buying it, basically calling him a threat to society and saying that he couldn't be let out as all his victims also feared him. The fight continues. Uh, we're not. We're, we're. We're not. We're not giving up by a long shot. Outside the New York City courthouse, his lawyer defiant. He believes he's innocent. Uh, I believe he's innocent. And we're going to fight this case with all of our might until we don't have to fight any longer. The judge ruling the bail package presented by Combs's lawyer was insufficient, siding with prosecutors who called Combs a threat to society, adding there is no condition that would assure that the rapper would not obstruct justice. Judges also pointed out the 2016 leaked Cassie video that showed him being violent towards his then girlfriend Cassie. The prosecutors insisted that he had to stay in jail, especially since they had also received evidence that he had tried to contact one witness over 50 times in just 24 hours, apparently in an attempt to threaten or coerce them. That shows Combs brutally beating his then-girlfriend, singer Cassie, who prosecutors say was attempting to escape from one of Combs' so-called freak-offs, elaborated coerced sex parties that he often recorded. Combs' lawyer laying out his defense in court, arguing that the worst thing his client has done was on the videotape, adding that the two had loved each other, in which the judge responded, what's love got to do with that, calling the video disturbing. Diddy's defense team was always the underdog in this bail argument, and that's because of the crime of human trafficking actually creates a presumption that the defendant should be detained. In its bail proposal, Combs' legal team pointing out he surrendered his passport, voluntarily relocated to New York ahead of his arrest, is attempting to sell his plane and hired private security to monitor Combs 24-7. However, prosecutors, who were adamant Combs remain in custody, pointed to what they describe as a massive amount of evidence, including text messages read in court from women accusing Combs of physical and sexual violence that went on for decades and vast efforts to cover it up.
adding witnesses universally share an extreme fear of the defendant. This is after his lawyer made multiple statements supporting Diddy after was first denied bail, saying that his willingness to cooperate with the investigation shows that he shouldn't have to stay in jail. Ironically, the one point he repeatedly brings up is his having to stay in less than comfortable conditions. He's in the special housing unit, uh, which is a very difficult place to be. Um, it's one of the things I'm going to take up with the judge today, that it's impossible to prepare for a trial uh, from where he is. We respectfully disagreed with, with the ruling, and that's why we're bringing it to, uh, to the district judge who's assigned to the case this afternoon. He also repeatedly implied that the government had a vendetta against Diddy by saying the feds didn't want the rapper to turn himself in despite him doing so, because then they couldn't ask for detention. It's obvious that he's going for a public sympathy narrative. And eventually he's going to be shown to be innocent. Um, and so tomorrow we fight again, and we fight, we'll fight. we fight every day until we don't have to fight anymore. Uh, I, I don't know. I, the question is, why did it happen last night instead of today? I, I don't know, know the answer to that question. We, 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 I just want to make one point very clear. We, 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 we have no power. All we can do is show good faith. He got on a plane and he came here. And if he stayed here for one day before the case started, or for one year before the case started, he was going to stay as long as he needed to stay. It ends up being only 12 days. That's fine. That's what the government wanted to do. The government didn't want him to turn himself in. He came here to turn himself in. Why doesn't the government want him to turn himself in? Because then they can't ask for detention. So they go and they arrest him. They arrest the guy who came to New York to turn himself in. But we are going to make all these points again, again tomorrow, and we'll make him as much as we can until we get him out. He again spoke about Diddy being a fighter after his bail was denied, saying that Diddy was being housed in inhumane conditions and that his client shouldn't have to live in a place like that. Good afternoon, everybody. So, um, so uh, we made a bail appeal uh, to Judge Carter. Uh, it did not go our way. Um, the fight continues. Uh, we're not. We're, we're. We're not. We're not giving up by a long shot. I told Mr. Combs um, I'm going to try and get his case to trial as quickly as possible. I'm going to try and minimize the amount of time he spends in very, very difficult, and I believe inhumane. Uh, housing conditions in the in the special housing unit of the Metropolitan Detention Facility, and I'm going to do everything that I can uh, to move his case as quickly as possible. I understand that the, the government has a great amount of electronic devices that they have to download and provide to me, but everything's on the government's timetable, nothing's on the defendant's timetable, and they're going to have to accommodate me and him and give us a, a, a quick trial uh, and I'm going to be pushing for that. Um, he's, he's ready, he's focused. Uh, he has been ready to defend this case since he first found out about this case. Nothing has changed from his perspective. I obviously would much prefer to fight this case with him out of jail, and we are going to try to bring that about. This after it came out that the place where he's being housed, the Metropolitan Detention Center, is known for its violent atmosphere. It's also where R. Kelly and Ghislaine Maxwell were placed. Inside a facility that is being called hell on earth. The Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn is notorious for its appalling living conditions and rampant violence. How bad is it inside this federal lockup? There have been two murders, four suicides, and numerous stabbings and lockdowns in recent years. It's so out of control inside that four federal judges are reportedly refusing to send any more prisoners here. Donald Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, spent a harrowing year in federal custody. He says for someone used to a life of luxury like Diddy, prison life is a severe shock. You have a desk, you have a plastic chair, you have your bed with a one and a half inch mattress, no pillow, and you also have a locker. So you basically have three feet by five feet to move around. So you have a basic 15 square feet. It is a horrible horrible place. As a result, Diddy's lawyer is trying to get him transferred to a New Jersey prison. In the past, uh, Essex County, Essex County, New Jersey, it's a, it's a county facility, but it has a contract with the federal government and you can get a certain number of federal inmates in Essex County, New Jersey. And in my experience, it's just a, it's just it's an easier place to deal with. Um, I think it's better for the, the person being housed there and it's easier to get access 
you know, to him. I mean, one of the hardest things when you're preparing for a very significant trial with a, a great deal of discovery is you want your client to be able to have access to, you know, the electronic discovery. Nothing nowadays is in paper form. Everything's electronic. So you need to make sure that your client has access to a computer. But it's ironic that his lawyer would talk about the terrible conditions Diddy has to face, considering he sent his former protege to jail for a decade with no remorse at all. Rapper turned politician Shine had to serve 10 years because he took the fall for the 1999 club New York shooting both Jennifer Lopez and Diddy were involved in. Before politician Moses Shine Barrow entered politics in his native Belize. This is someone that destroyed my life. He was a rapper who had a mentor named Sean Diddy Combs. But Barrow was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison. I was defending him and he turned around and called witnesses to testify against me and he contributed, he pretty much sent me to prison. Barrow was released in 2009 and deported to Belize. He insists that he never took part in any of Diddy's alleged freak-offs, parties where people were forced into sex acts with male prostitutes. I had nothing to do with Sean Combs' uh, personal life, no interaction. That level, everything was strictly on a professional level. Shine set the record straight on their relationship, saying that he was never involved in any of the freak-offs. He said that just because he forgave Diddy doesn't mean he had a friendly personal relationship with him. He pretty much sent me to prison. That is the context by which you must always describe that relationship. I forgave, I moved on, but let us not pretend as if I was in Miami for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Shine insinuated that he and Combs are not as close as some would think. Despite his forgiving heart, he made sure to set the record straight about their relationship. Quote, so let us not lose sight of what the cold, hard facts are, Shine stated. This is not someone who I vacationed with and who he and I enjoyed this great intimate relationship of brotherhood. This is someone who destroyed my life and who I forgave and who I moved on. Over the years, Shine has worked with Diddy to bring resources to Belize, yet he clarified that their partnership was strictly business. Strictly business. But some people point out that he seemed happy to let people think he was friends with Diddy again while he had power, but is now quick to distance himself. What do you think? Meanwhile, there's a good reason people think Diddy's lawyer Mark Agnafilo might quit soon. Part of it is that everyone who has worked with him in the past has nothing good to say about him. One example is his ex-publicist, who called him someone who manipulates narratives to suit him. This is somewhat similar to what Rodney Jones alleged in his lawsuit against the rapper, saying he used to associate himself with priest T.D. Jakes and studies his mannerisms to present himself as a humble and approachable person. Of course, his ex-publicist did say that he worked for him years ago and his experience was overall not bad. He said that he was bossy and called him like 20 times a day, but he was still shocked by the allegations because he didn't see him as that sort of person. I was Diddy's publicist for a couple of years, about 20 years ago, so 2003, 2004. I ended up doing his publicity for, for, for a couple of years. He was a really instrumental person in my PR life. I'd never really represented a celebrity as big as that. I went on to represent other big stars, but he was sort of like my first. And in many ways, he taught me how to be a publicist. He knows how to manipulate a narrative. He knows how to tell a story. He knows how to be exciting, flashy. And so I've got to be honest here, my time with Diddy. He also said Said that he was a very different person at the time, but he still loved being a celebrity. Yeah, and I think this is um, backed up in the lawsuit when, when 20 years ago, Diddy seemed to be a much different man than he was just 10 years ago. So I did not see any of this behavior. Did I see him being treated like a king? Of course. Did I see him enjoying being a celebrity? Yes, of, of all the big stars I've worked with. 
Diddy enjoyed being Diddy more than anybody else. He loved the spotlight. He loved people talking about him. Meanwhile, he also pointed out that his current publicist, Natalie Moore, seems to have also jumped ship. He also thinks his chief of staff, Christina Corum, will soon get dragged into the trial as well. She was promoted to Diddy's chief of staff back in 2020, and she's very important to him. Holmes has even written about her on social media. Meet Christina Corum, chief of staff at Combs Enterprises. Christina, aka KK, keeps everything in my life and my business running. She's been my right hand for the last eight years and has consistently proven to execute and get S word done. Don't know how I'd function without her. In another post, Diddy wrote, Happy birthday to my ace, Boon Coon, my right hand, my day-to-day -day manager that keeps my world twirling and she's always got my back. She makes sure that I smile every day and I don't go into those dark places. Today is your day. It's your mother effing birthday. Go KK. It's your birthday. Love you at Christina Quorum. There are people around Diddy who have been there for decades. Recently, his longtime publicist, Natalie Moore, who's been there for 20 years. She looks, appears as if she has quit. Her phone is no longer ringing. Her email has been discontinued. Also to his chief of staff, Kristin Karim, who has been with him for several years too. People have called her the Ghislaine Maxwell of this organization. That is nothing that anybody ever wants to be called. And so other people here are involved News has come out about Diddy looking for a new crisis management team after his last one quit on him. Yup, it's Natalie Moore who quit, and it looks like Diddy is having a hard time looking for a new team. Because she had been with him for over two decades, I know this woman quite well, and I gave her a call and a text on mm. Thursday saying, hey, I've got a story here that Diddy has been looking for a crisis management PR team for since over six months, since last year, right, almost right after the Cassie allegations were settled. And she didn't get back to me. The next thing you know, she announces she has quit. So here's the deal. One of the reasons she quit, I am sure, is that A, what is she going to do in this situation? Yeah, but it's B, a hard thing to fix. The, a hundred percent, but also the crisis management PR people that he has been reaching out to charge at minimum 30 grand a month, nowhere near what he was paying his longtime PR person. So it's a little bit of like, hey, thanks for nothing. Yeah. Also, Paula, we've all been talking about this week. For now, his lawyer seems to still be Team Diddy. He's come out with a statement following the news that Diddy has been placed on suicide watch, saying his client was just fine. A source tells NBC News that the decision to put the music producer on suicide watch is routine, calling it, quote, procedural with high profile clients. Diddy's lawyer, Mark Agnafilo, also tells TMZ that after spending hours with the bad boy entertainment founder in federal lockup, he viewed his client as, quote, not at all suicidal, calling him, quote, strong, healthy, confident, and focused on his defense. But how long is he going to stick with him? Will he stay on even if it looks like Diddy is fighting a losing battle? Or will the disgraced mogul have to look for a new legal team as well? Let's wait and see. That's it for now. Don't forget to tell us what you think in the comments below. For more updates, hit the bell icon.